Hi beauties, it's Shovel. Welcome back to my channel and thank you for clicking on another video. Are you sitting comfortably? Have you got a cup of tea? I was gonna say cup of tea. I don't have cup of tea. I have juice. <laughs> juice? Honestly, this juice could not be more shabba. There is a pink swirly straw in the pink strawberry juice. It's actually strawberry watermelon. Love the squash. Shout out to Robinsons. Please work with me. I love you. In a celestial graph. I think that's what this is called. Graph. It's giving pink on pink on pink on pink. I don't know where the fourth pink came from, but there you go. Regardless of your beverage of choice, are you ready for us to deep dive into into just no mother-in-laws. I love this series. As I always say, we can learn so much from the storytelling of others, and this one in particular is more on the spicy side. So I don't know if you've ever had a problem with your mother-in-law, but whether you are watching this for some cathartic relief or because you genuinely have an issue with your mother-in-law, let's get down to it. Get down to it. Let's see here. Ooh. Mother-in-law wants control over wedding guest list and is bribing us. I see, there is no shallow end to this pool. My fiance and I are planning our wedding and his mum wanted to go over the wedding list with us. She's been hinting at us, inviting a bunch of old family friends that I've either never met or have never treated me like part of the family. My fiance and I have been dating for nine years, so if I don't know them, they are probably not very important in his life. I see you. And I feel like we've started on like a classic psychology textbook of wedding planning. I don't know if such a book exists, but such a book should probably exist because this is the most common thing that I see about wedding dramas. It's about guest lists, which cause the most amount of stress, and it's about parents clashing with the guest list, often because parents want to invite extra people or more people, and the couple are like, who are you? Who is this person? And why are you supposedly important in our life when I haven't heard about you in the entire time that we've been together? Honestly, I don't understand. It's so confusing to me. I remember one of the people that came to my family's wedding was, I, I kid you not, this is a legit thing, the person who made the curtains, the seam stress of a second generation family member. And I heard that and I was like, now I understand why Asian weddings are like a thousand people big. Which again, is not an exaggeration. I genuinely know Asian weddings that have been over a thousand people. Anyway, OP continues, what bothers me most is that she's a religious woman and she didn't consider me family and would often exclude me from family events and say that I wasn't part of the family because we are not married by the church. So this is mother-in-law. But when talking about these people, she states that they are practically family in bunnies because they've been around for so long and should be treated like family. Wow, the double standards. She states that they're very invested in our lives by extension of her because they ask about us all the time. Well, in that regard, every single Swifty should be asking for an invite to Taylor Swift's wedding or any kind of fandom at all, which is just so unrealistic to set the standards of, ah, has thought about, ah, has asked about, what, what? You reckon Piers Morgan is invited to a bunch of weddings? Cause I'm sure he asks about and inquires about a lot of celebrity lives and they don't particularly want him to be there either. So sit down, mother-in-law, sit down. Yesterday, when going over the wedding list with her, by her request, she got very upset that six people in particular were not invited. I don't know why I'm trying to side or like find some good things about the mother-in-law here, but I'm like, at least it was only six. But six people were not invited. And my fiance made a point to note that she's not contributing any money to the wedding and we're on a tight budget. So it's difficult to add people. Look, this money thing, I get it. It's a really easy thing to hide behind. And I also did this with a family member who kept inviting inviting people to a party that I was holding. I was like, if you want to invite them, the cost of this party is X amount per head. You pay for it. She's like, but I already invited them. Then I'm like, well, it sounds like you either have a hefty bill that you owe me or you're going to have to uninvite a lot of people then, aren't you? And then she did uninvite those people. And I was grateful because the reality is it's not about the money. I just didn't want people being in this intimate, safe space that I didn't know or that my partner didn't know. It's important. The atmosphere, the environment, there's so much more to a guest list than just people coming to eat food and say that they went. You know, I feel like if that is your purpose for, for having having a wedding, then you're kind of doing it for the wrong reasons. Mother-in-law called back today after my fiance wasn't with me. She likes to talk to him in private because I normally shut her down and offered to give us up to 5,000 for the wedding. I imagine this is dollars or pounds. That's what I'm gonna like assume because that, that sounds like a lot of money. And she was petitioning for the people that she wanted to be invited to the wedding. She stated that she was already planning on giving us this money and that it's not a bribe and her offering the money because we're struggling is independent of who we decided to invite to the wedding. Hmm. Based on that last sentence, I mean, she said she was going to. And she's literally saying, she's clarifying the boundary here, that it's not to do with who you invite. I think it's a little bit fair for you to say that it's a bribe. But let's finish the post though, hang on. She's always been very controlling and very 
expressive of her opinions and I'm afraid to take the money because I feel like I'm selling her my wedding to do with what she wants. I think it's something she'll never let me forget and I'll pay for it tenfold in the future. So should I take the money and should I invite her family friends? Wow. It's really hard to comment on financial decisions like this because nobody knows the nuance of the context more than you do. The reality is there are multiple options. Perhaps it could go all wonderful and swimmingly. Maybe she's telling the truth and giving that money to you was always something that she intended to do and she just thought of it now because your fiance specifically said, look, we're on a tight budget. And she's also specifically said, look, take it and regardless of who you invite, you can have this money. At the same time, you know, because you have experienced the micro actions within this context, how that feels. And your gut, you gotta listen to that gut, baby. You know, don't you? You know, they, it knows. It always knows. If you have an inkling that there are strings attached to this, even if someone is saying that there's no strings attached, then maybe if you're in a financial position to do so, it's not a good idea to take the money, you know? I think regardless of the money issue, you certainly should not be inviting her family friends. If these are not people that you want or your fiance wants, then don't invite them. Yes, there are definitely some times in which you could compromise. My nan, for example, has this one friend and she was coming to this thing that I was doing and I was like, sure, bring your friend because I didn't want her to be lonely. But having one person to not be lonely is very different to inviting six guests that you don't know when your mum is already, or mother-in-law is already gonna have other people to speak with, you know? So it's a very personal decision, but I have a feeling that regardless of the decision of you take on the money, you should certainly say no to the invitation invitation of the friends invitation invitation and actually i kind of feel like if you did that first and was just like okay well we're not inviting the friends just kind of like waiting the ball is in her court now <laughs> waiting for a response see if she's like fine then i won't give you the 5k because if that's what she does then you know that the money has strings attached to it you know those are my thoughts i don't know if i'm just seeing this too black and white i realize that it's so much easier for me as an objective person to this situation to be like hmm i see this and this is what you should do but actually being the person to do that is a very different ball game. Whether it's because of financial reasons and you're like, oh my goodness, the idea of an extra 5,000 pounds is so incredibly enticing and would help us out a lot right now. Because I know if a parent offered me 5,000 pounds during my wedding planning, I would jump at that. Weddings are spenny, even when like you don't want them to be. <laughs> like even a very basic wedding is quite expensive. I don't know what the costs are around the world, but even just to like register your marriage and do the legal part. Though we're not talking about cake, we're not talking about outfits, we're just talking about the literal getting married. Okay. Shall we see what other people have to say? Do we have the same mother-in-law? Lol. We lol or else we cry. Seriously though, we had a similar rule about relatives. My dear husband has a big family and we've dated for years before we got married. So if I hadn't met them, they weren't invited. Welp, several uninvited relatives showed up with the invited ones. They were wearing jeans and ball caps. No, to a cocktail attire wedding? Oh, I mean, it's not about the outfit, but just the fact that they would come and then do something that you absolutely didn't want just feels really sad. I say I'm still annoyed, but honestly, I've let it go. You channeled it and Elsa, babe. That's the one and only time I've met them and I'm now very, very, very low contact with my mother-in-law. Wow. I'm sorry this has happened. However, one wonderful thing to learn from this is that A, it reinforces the idea that we should be doing things for ourselves. If it is your wedding, if it is your day, you get to decide who you want to share that special moment with. Two, I think we need security. <laughs> in these kind of like aspects, again, it can be an additional cost, but also it doesn't have to be a cost. We definitely had security measures in place for our wedding, but one of the things that was instrumentally helpful was actually just speaking with the venue and explaining who in particular we didn't want there and we're trying to safeguard against. And that was a really reassuring conversation to have. It didn't cost anything extra in terms of the wedding venue and their support. So don't be afraid to ask for that. If you're in a situation where you're like, you know what? I don't want these people here. Often venues will have a team of staff members who are there sort of like helping you out and they'll have like a little guest list and you can make sure that only the people on the guest list get in and everyone else can go to another assigned contact. Just make sure it's not you on the day because you don't want to be dealing with that stress. But a trusted loved one who can have it and who knows who you would and wouldn't want there. Great idea. <laughs> highly, highly recommend. I think the final thing that we can learn from this as well is rules. I love the fact that there's criteria in place and it reminds me of another couple that I just went to the wedding to. It was so beautiful and so cute and they actually enforce a rule that during the set period leading up to the wedding, I can't remember if it was six months or a year, but they made an effort to go and see, like meet with and speak with and hang out with every single one of their guests. They were only inviting people that they know and they were making sure that the people they were inviting were people that they had 
seen very recently, which I think is like a really wonderful way to ensure this safe space. If you have people who are like, well, I want to invite this person that only knew you when you were three years old and pooping in nappies. Do you poop in a nappy at three years old? I don't, I don't know these things, but you know what I mean. My son recently graduated from high school and I'm planning his grad party. I'll tell you what I told my husband about the guest list. If they can't pick my son out of a crowd of 18 year olds, they don't need to come to the party. And the same should be for your wedding. I do like this. I don't think it works in all circumstances, but I do like the idea of being so stern with the rules and it's a great idea for some people that might work really well. It doesn't necessarily work if your mother-in-law's like, <laughs> look, look at these people that don't want to speak with you, but you know about them. These one-sided relationships, these forced relationships with like tension and family politics and baggage and history. They're all too common and I wish they weren't. Shout it from the rooftops. Don't take the money. It is 100% coming with strings and this is why I didn't take a dime from mine and my wedding turned out great. I'm very happy for you. I love the fact that you're enforcing that this is an option. I'm just going to state as well, I do think it's important that we remember that it can come from a sense of relative privilege as to how easy it is to take that money. But I do, I agree with you. If you're the kind of person who knows what this forum is, who is utilizing this forum for advice and who genuinely has that gut feeling, you can listen to the queen gut that this is coming with some form of string. Probably means it's coming with some form of string. Shall we look at another boop? My mother-in-law only refers to me as a boob. No. <laughs> Oh, no, that's so rude. <laughs> Sorry, I just find it a tiny little bit funny. Not this, because th no, not this. It just made me think of what a wonderful insult that would be among friends. I could absolutely see myself being like, Jamie, you boob. I will probably actually do this. But sorry, I, di I didn't mean to trivialize this title. Serious face, let's go. Whenever the baby settles in my arms or stops crying when he's with me, mother-in-law will make a comment like, he's quiet now because he can smell his mum's boob. Or he's hungry, he just wants mum's boob. It's like she can't fathom acknowledging that my baby loves me and needs me. She's reduced my role to nothing but a boob. I am breastfeeding and not the baby's mother. And it's very disturbing. Hmm. Interesting. Is this a just no mother-in-law to you? Unless there is other sort of examples that you are able to provide. I kind of feel like maybe this title is the tiniest bit misleading. And I understand that that can happen if you're feeling some kind of way. It sounds like you have a huge level of resentment towards mother-in-law. I'm not sure. Objectively as an outsider looking in if mother-in-law is calling you a boob. Th that's not what's happening. He's quiet now because he can smell his mum's boob. He's hungry. He just wants mum's boob. Maybe I'm I'm splitting hairs over this. I kind of feel like there is more to this story that we are not seeing and a large part of that hidden context or unspoken context is a resentment from you that's really reading into these words in like a very hateful way. And it might be that you are entirely justified to do that, my love. But going from the information that I can see right here, I'm not sure if this is like a just no mother-in-law, you know? Just just from this post alone, I don't think I would be mad if my mother-in-law did this. I understand how it might be a bit frustrating, a little bit odd to be like, why do you need to specify my boob specifically? It's because you're talking about milk, right? Mother-in-law is talking about milk. And maybe if we are thinking about like a loaded history and why people often come to this forum, if other things are happening and she really is reducing you to a boob, it might be that mother-in-law is feeling some kind of way about being disconnected from the child and is like, ah, oh, you can do something that I can't and I'm needing to reinforce that the reason that little baby Squish is wanting to be with you right now and not me is because you have the boob of juice. <laughs> The boob of dinner. No, I don't have said boob. And perhaps that's like a level of hurt, which is causing this kind of reason for her to emphasize. But this alone, I feel like saying that like, oh, he's hungry, he just wants your boob. Or he's quiet now because he can smell you. I'm not sure if that's her not acknowledging that the baby loves you and reducing your role to the breastfeeding and like, and, and mentioning that like you, you are the baby's mum. I feel like in some ways that could even be seen as like re-emphasizing that point. You know, like you are primary caregiver and he's quiet now because you have been able to provide the boob in a way that I could never do. I don't know. However, regardless of what is being said, the fact is you are stating you don't like it. And if you don't like it, regardless of whether someone's intentions were to offend you, the fact is a loving person would need to listen to that and be like, hmm, I can see that I have offended you and I'm sorry. And if you don't like me saying boob in your presence, I will not. You know what I mean? Like it is kind of weird phrasing. Like I wouldn't expect a normal mother-in-law to just be like, blah, 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 your boob. So if someone doesn't like that, you can be sensitive to to that and just respect their wishes because it's a kind thing to do. Even if objectively it's not offensive, it's clearly bothering mum and making mum feel some kind of way. So mother-in-law could just not do that thing and the world would be a much nicer place if we just respected people when what they're doing doesn't hurt anybody. I wish that I could bake a cake made out of rainbows and smiles and we'd all eat it. 
be happy. Or when what they're requesting doesn't hurt anybody. Start mooing <laughs> to someone every time. Every time she makes a comment like this, moo. If she's gonna reduce you to a milk cow, then make it awkward and uncomfortable for everyone. I love this idea because I like the idea that like you're trivializing to reclaim the power, right? Through comedy, through happiness, through confidence, which is what jokes evoke to me. I don't think it's going to be uncomfortable for everyone. I think other people would laugh a lot and maybe if mother-in-law doesn't like that they get the message but it could also be something that if mother-in-law is not intending to be like a bad thing could just end up becoming a running joke where mother-in-law would say it more for you to then say it more. I don't know if you're like you're really feeling some kind of way if this is like the right path for you but I like the suggestion. It's very creative. A plus for creative problem solving. I also find it really funny that someone's saying like reducing you to a milk cow as if Cows are the only animals that provide milk from their boobs. <laughs> I mean, why are cows not milk humans? I did have this conversation with a loved one where they were like, oh my God, udders look so much like nipples. And I was like, that's because they are. And they were like, <laughs> they were so mind blown at the parallel. They didn't realize that an udder was a boob. And this is why we need better sex education in schools. I swear to God, boobs do not serve a primarily sexual purpose. And the world needs to know that. Oh, WTF, this is incredibly inappropriate. Is it just me? Am I just being like too chill today? I don't know. I personally didn't see it as inappropriate. However, I'm not you. So it's okay. It's okay to have differing opinions. Come on now, I'm more than a milk girl. Well, if you're just a boob, then she's just an asshole. So here we are. <laughs> call me a boob again mother-in-law i dare you call me a boob go on call me a boob i dare you i know where you live full-on threatened this commenter does go on to say that if you forget or she's like testing the boundaries of that you can be like okay out you go you're on a time out for the rest of the week if it happens again it'll be a month and if it happens after that a year so please call me a boob again i feel like this would be such an appropriate response and i feel like setting those boundaries to be like look i'm not gonna speak with you i need some time away and you need to feel some form of consequence for doing something that disrespects me absolutely if mother-in-law was is is not was is actually calling you a boob absolutely Absolutely. I would be pissed, but I feel like referring to your boob is different to calling you a boob. Am I splitting boob hairs? I'd love to know your opinions on this one, Peaches. Let me know down below. Just remember to be kind. Let's be kind to one another. But clearly you're having an issue, OP, and I really do hope that it's fixed. And in all seriousness, I really do think this last suggestion of being like, fine, well, if you are not going to respect me, then I'm not going to put myself in a position to be disrespected. Bye. That's a very good way to manage and maintain your boundaries. Whatever those boundaries may be. Boob. <laughs> Mother-in-law problem or husband problem? Ooh, uh, we've got a question. Let's try and solve it. My escape room brain is like engaged. My husband and I haven't really had a positive day in a while. It's been hard to get along after I decided to have no communication with his mother. Ooh, that's tricky. I'm sorry that that's a huge presence on your relationship and that you're feeling the toil of that presence. Let's read on. Today, I really wanted to just have a good day with him. We were invited to lunch at his friend's house and I thought that the day went well. We had a good time. I thought we were gonna continue having a good moment for the rest of the day or night. On our way home, he mentions to me how he likes how his friend's wife and her mother-in-law look so close and happy, and he likes how the wife treats her mother-in-law so nicely and wishes that me and his mother were like that too, because that's how it's in bunnies supposed to be. To hear comparisons being made, I feel like it's okay for somebody to voice that. Like truly, if that's how they're feeling, they're like, wow, I wish we had the dynamic that these people have. But how it's received can sometimes, you can hear things differently to how they are said. And maybe what husband is saying here is I wish the circumstances were different where you and mother-in-law and therefore us as a family network could have a similar relationship and bond and warmth as our friend does. But maybe what you heard was, you're a problem and I want you to fix things with mother-in-law, which is why I'm telling you to do these things in order for us to be like that. It depends on what the intention and the intended outcome, right, is specifically of him saying that. Is it for you to change your actions? Is it a call out or is it just a, oh, I'm sharing with you how I feel and I'm feeling sad that I don't have that and I wish that we did, but we don't. So, boob. <laughs> you know? Let's read on. His friend's mother is a nice woman. She helps them out, helps take care of the two kids, helps them with down payments to buy their house, not to mention that she treats her daughter-in-law with so much love and respect. And if I had that kind of mother-in-law, I'd have a great relationship with her. But sadly, I don't. My mother-in-law is inappropriate, selfish, very mean, and a toxic woman. Ah, that sucks. And I can totally see why being primed with that history and maybe past circumstances of husband being like, give it a go. Come on, try. It could 
it would be very frustrating to hear such a comment and be like, yes, but we are not the same, are we? It's very lovely to be nice to a bunny compared to a dragon. I see it. I see where this has gone wayward and I guess there is a very mature way to approach that to be like, honey, lover, boo boo. Are you trying to say that you want me to fix a relationship or are you just voicing sadness that you're feeling? Because I too feel that sadness and I wish that we had the same thing, but we don't. Unfortunately, mother-in-law makes it very difficult for that to be the case. That is a very different response to what I imagine might happen, which is a big blowout. But let's read on. The conversation on our way home went left quickly. I went from wanting to have a positive day with him to wanting to get out the car as soon as possible to get away from him as soon as possible. So this has clearly triggered you. Next thing you know, we're screaming at each other because I mentioned to him how his mum's called me so much stress whilst I was pregnant that I ended up oh, nearly losing the baby. He keeps defending her, protecting her and ruining our days. This isn't the first time that he's thrown a perfect day by mentioning his mum. Okay, I have something to say about this situation. And it's because I feel like multiple times out, like at least three times out this post, you have like really linked together this idea of a perfect day being ruined by your husband saying something. And I feel like what's a perfect day for you may not be a perfect day for your husband. A perfect day for you seems to be no one saying anything that you disagree upon. But healthy communication can absolutely be communication where you disagree. And I feel like holding and trying to curate this idea of like a perfect day being a day when nothing is said to you that could upset you puts a lot of pressure, babe, on you, on the day, on the people that you're with to not step on eggshells. That's a lot. I feel like if I was OP's therapist right now, I would definitely be calling that up in a kind way to be like, hey, maybe we don't need to put the value and worth of the entire day on one comment. And our sense of self-regulation can go a long way to maintaining these ideas of what good days are versus bad days. So this idea of like ruining the day just by being honest not only sort of negatively affects OP but also makes it really difficult for husband right who clearly is having a problem with this and also wants to voice it. Does that make sense? The idea of defending though must be very frustrating and it sounds like it's a tenseness that you are you're just waiting for him to mention and he is just mentioning and you were gonna blow up anyway. You were gonna have this moment anyway because this is an unresolved issue that keeps being brought up and even the idea of that is gonna ruin this sense of a perfect day right because you're gonna be like when's it gonna happen? I know he's gonna say something. I feel like what probably needs to happen here is you just need to address it properly and thoroughly and set boundaries within the two of you of how this is addressed. Because if he keeps defending and protecting mother-in-law in a way that isn't right for you, maybe one of the things that you need to do is to not talk about it. Maybe one of the things that you need to do is say, hey, husband, I appreciate that this makes you feel some kind of way and you need an outlet for those feelings. I cannot be that outlet because I feel hurt and experience this from a really biased point of view, which means that I can't be there to support you with a more neutral lens. Let's find you someone who can. Let's find you a friend. Let's find you a sibling. Someone who's not going to make the situation worse <laughs> with the mother-in-law, but someone who you can actively seek that support from because I can't give that to you. And then with those boundaries in place, husband can feel what he's feeling and process what he's processing and you can feel what you're feeling and you know <laughs> that these perfect days are not going to have these conversations whilst husband's needs are also being accommodated. It's not that I never want him to mention his mum to me. It just hurts me that he won't even acknowledge that she hurt me. Okay. It's not even him bringing it up, but it's what he's saying, which therefore makes me feel like it's not that first thing of him just being like, oh, God, why can't this be better? Do better. Like he's saying it as an action point for you to try and make things better with mother-in-law, which I can understand be very frustrating. Exhausting even. Woof. The other day he pretended to get it after our argument and apologized that his mum was hurtful. Hmm? But, oh, there's always a but. What is the point of apologizing, says OP, if you're gonna scream at me one week later defending her? Communication is key. And it sounds to me like there's not very good communication going on. I'm starting to notice that maybe I just have a husband problem because if I felt protected the right way, maybe I wouldn't let his mother affect me this much. I know a lot of people who have problems with their mother-in-law, but their relationship is not ruined because their husbands take the wife's side. I don't even contact his mother anymore. I should be living in peace. What are your thoughts? Is it a mother-in-law problem or a husband problem? Honestly, sounds like it's both. Sounds like it's all three. It's a mother-in-law problem, it's a husband problem, I see you problem. But the you problem, I feel like, is very easily fixed with husband, with just some healthy communication. That only being on the basis that husband is okay and like can actually deal with the fact that you do not want a relationship with mother-in-law, which is totally your prerogative. Regardless of whatever went on there, you don't want a relationship with that person, that is okay. They have hurt you, that is not okay. It's also okay for husband to want to be there for his mum in a way that you feel that you cannot, but it's not okay for your husband to like, trying to 
jam a square peg in a circle hole, just like constantly trying to make this relationship between the two of you compatible when it's not compatible. I feel like here though, in this context of what you're asking, you got a husband problem. Mother-in-law is not the problem here. Mother-in-law is not the one nattering away and saying things. This is your husband making those decisions. And sounds like not really agreeing with what the, whatever the root of the problem was between you and mother-in-law. And a lot of communication, deep, heavy, what's going to seem very annoying and things that you don't want to do communication is required to open that box up so that you can put it to one side. You have a huge hubby problem and he will never change. Look after yourself and move on, says someone. I wonder if this should have been on the Just No Mill forum. I feel like this is definitely more of a hubby problem than it is mother-in-law problem. Clearly the root is the mother-in-law, but you know, like we didn't hear anything about the mother-in-law. So that's why I'm questioning that. I guess like the thing that's stopping me from being able to be like, yo, P, cheerleader, yeah, yeah, you know, like, just like follow and support is this idea that like he will never change. I don't feel we've got like enough context to know if he's the one that should be changing. He clearly feels that whatever happened, he's defending her and not you. Why is that? I'm not saying that you were wrong in the situation, OP. What I'm saying is this is more than just like ruining a perfect day or, you know, like wanting communications to happen. This is like a, a resentment that he is harboring that goes beyond mother-in-law and is affecting his relationship with you. So I really hope that can be fixed. OP's actually responded and said, yeah, I'm starting to realize realize that I used to think my mother-in-law was a problem. We basically thought about her for a year and we've only been married for two, but now I'm realizing it's not really mother-in-law that's a problem. No matter what the issue, I will not feel protected in this marriage. I'm really sorry. This sounds so heartful and so hard. I'm sad that one issue with one person has caused this strain on your relationship. I'm really hoping that you guys are going to be able to talk through and fix it, but if not, absolutely, you should just be doing what's right for you. First and foremost, it's not fair for you to feel unprotected or unsafe with the person that you're supposed to feel the most vulnerable with. Absolutely, Absolutely a husband problem if he was doing what he was supposed to do, defending you, talking up for you, putting her in her place instead of blaming it on you, it would be a non-issue. To card him, he needs therapy. I'm struggling to see how all of these forums are like, yeah, 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 without knowing like the basic issue because i have no idea what mother-in-law has done right i do think that husbands should be defending and like talking up for you and putting mother-in-law in her place if you did no wrong but i don't think that blindly following or blindly supporting and saying that you're right without actually like knowing what's wrong what the issue is is a good idea at all you both need therapy all the best op oh goodness this is hard all right should we do one more let's do one more my mother-in-law wants to buy us a king size bed and is annoyed that I've said no. Mm. So my husband and I are moving with our four month old baby. Congratulations on your little squish, four months old. That's like a squishy squish. We're moving into a new house with four bedrooms because we plan on having one or two more kids in the future. Congratulations to you. It makes sense. My mother-in-law wants to buy us a king size bed for our guest bedroom that they can use when they visit. Oh, it's for them. Ha! I thought mother-in-law wanted to buy a bed for you two and you said no, but no, no. She wants to buy a bed for them. Hmm. That definitely changes the context. The only problem, says OP, is that our guest bedroom will eventually become our second kid's bedroom and then our third bedroom will be the guest room slash office. Wait, hang on. So you've got four rooms. You and partner are in one room. Four month old baby has a room and then you have a guest room and an office. I'm seeing this. I'm also spocking right now. Okay. Then when you have another child, this guest bedroom is going to become second baby's room okay which means the guest bedroom and the office is going to be one then when you have your third kid i imagine you just won't have a guest room and maybe you'll get like a sofa bed makes sense that is so so logical i hear you okay so what is the issue we explained to her that a king will most likely not fit in with the office desk okay so when you do have this kid and eventually make this the joint room the bed that the in-laws are wanting to get for this room won't fit in this room okay do they know that you're wanting more children and that this is your plan to have that as a third room the rooms are pretty small says OP. However, she says that a queen size bed won't work for her and father-in-law. My father-in-law is six foot five and 280 pounds in brackets, a very big dude. I don't know what this is. Hang on. I know what six foot five is because Jamie's six foot one and everyone's like, what? Jamie's six foot one? He's nearly six foot two. And every time we meet people, they're like, huh, I really expected you to be shorter. <laughs> so I, I understand that, but what is 280 pounds? I work in kilograms. A hundred and 27 kilograms. I mean, it gives me a better idea of weight, but I can't envisage. I don't know how people do that. How they're like, mm, yeah, you must be about this weight. Like how do these numbers compute to shapes in your brain? I'll just take a word for it. He's a big dude. Okay. They live across the country, but are rich. And so they visit us often. Well, if they are so rich and are demanding beds be in your house to a certain spec, why don't they get a hotel? Because I don't think it's very fair to be like in your house, I'm going to make you order this furniture for us. <laughs> Let's read on. We don't want them to buy a king size bed that we have to resell in three years or so when we have our second kid. Cause you don't think that the bed is going to fit in this room. I hear you. My husband and I are hoping that next year they only 
family visit two or three times, but it seems that they're not willing to give up this dream of a king size bed. Also kind of feel like if the in-laws are going to that extent, where they're like, mm, I'm going to buy the specific bed. Maybe they have like wants to visit you for more than two to three times. It just feels like a lot of effort for two to three times to be so specific about wanting a king instead of a queen. What is the difference? Okay, standard king is 76 inches wide and 80 inches long. Again, numbers, shapes, shoves brain, blah, blah, blah. But a queen is 60 inches wide and 80 inches long. So it's the same length. It's just a different width. Okay, so the fact that your father-in-law is six foot five has nothing to do with it because it's the same long. <laughs> the long is the same. It's the wides. 60 instead of 76 inches, which means it's 16 inches slimmer, like less wide. What is 16 inches? 16 inches is 40 centimeters. It is a ruler and a third of a ruler, which is like that. Excuse me now, come on. You're telling me the difference between a queen and a king is this and this is what you are complaining about. I don't care what size you are. You can be a chicken nugget or you can be a giant. This much space for a guest bedroom that is not in your house is negligible, get in the bin. I mean, it's, it's not negligible. There's a reason that there's a size difference between the two, but I just think that is absolutely ridiculous that you're like, oh, this is why I need to, no, no, it is not your house. Don't be so picky. Let's carry on, <laughs> let's finish the story. We told her no, and we haven't moved yet. So we don't even know the dimensions of each room. Totally reasonable. We move in two weeks, they visit in three weeks. All right, be me, oh my God. So they want this decision soon. They've just bought their tickets before our house went on the market and they're non-refundable. Wow, okay. so they they are coming in three weeks, which is fine. And it sounds like you guys have a relationship regardless. <laughs> I do think it's absolutely ridiculous for you to buy any furniture for your house that you haven't even got the dimensions of. No, you need to go and you need to see the space. Some people don't even buy furniture until they've like lived in it for a while. Cause it might be that what you think might be one bedroom isn't gonna be your primary bedroom. You maybe would want one room for an office. You're gonna try it out for a little bit with your existing furniture before deciding actually, maybe it's this one or the other one. Then you're gonna try it in another one. And then after you have made those decisions, once you have broken the house in, which is totally a thing that people do, you can then be like, okay, cool. This is what I'm thinking. This is what we're gonna upgrade. Maybe that's a nice way that you can phrase it for your in-laws to be like, hey, we're breaking the house and we don't actually know what room's gonna be what. So like, you wanna get a bed? Sure, but not now. Also beds have huge lead times if you're buying new. So it's not like they're going to have the bed in three weeks anyway. You can't just like buy a bed and take it from the shop and bring it home. That's not how it works. The delivery times on sofas, it's like the, the most annoying thing and the most shocking thing when I moved actually, I was like, oh, really? Like we got in and we chose our sofas and we did all the fun things and they were like, yep, you're gonna go in four months and I was like oh, what? four months but yeah it's true like big pieces of furniture have huge lead times so what is the rush just wait wait for you to break in the house also if you want a queen bed like it sounds like you want them to get a bed and getting a queen bed would be a good idea it is your house you can put your foot down and say this is what I want based on the dimensions of the room you can be like well I live here and you don't and I know what my plans are for this room and I'm telling you that this much space I would rather have as floor space because in terms of bed space it's not that big deal but in terms of floor space it makes a very big deal and if you really really insist on sleeping on a king size bed then there's a great holiday in down the road that you can go to. I'm pretty certain you can specify a king size bed there. Bye. <laughs> that would be my plan. You're not being a just no daughter-in-law. I think you're just wanting to assert autonomy in your own house, which makes a lot of sense to me. You absolutely have a right to do that. And I think that father-in-law size is being used as an excuse and you need to be careful because I really feel like this is a boundary that you can enforce and you saying, no, I do not want this king size bed as you're wanting is more than just the size of the bed. It is more than just 16 inches of space. This is saying, this is my house, watch your step. And I feel like that is a message that needs to be received and heard loud and clear. Best of luck, my love. What other people have to say? Do they agree? They can stay in a hotel during their stay if they feel so strongly for a larger bed. Mm -hmm. Someone's responded to the fact that the father in law is six foot five and 280 pounds and said, my husband is six foot 10 and over 300 pounds. And when the only option is queen size bed, we make it work. Mother-in-law can pound sand. What does that mean? <laughs> to do something that has no purpose and is a waste of time. Pound sand. I've never heard that before. I kind of like it. Go pound sand. <laughs> okay. My ex was six foot six and 300 pounds and a queen worked just fine for us. A king in a spare room is excessive in my opinion. Look, it's your house. If you want a king, you get a king. You want a queen, you get a queen. Money dependent, of course. But if this is like a cute little housewarming gift, it's not little, it's quite a big housewarming gift that your in-laws are giving you, they need to respect the size, the specification that you want for your home. It is not their bed. It is your guest room bed. And if they happen to be guests on times that you want, then uh, that is is the vibe, the atmosphere, the expectations that we need to reinforce in their brains. I'd really love to know your experiences though, Peaches, if you're happy to share with like sizes and beds, because we have had a double for the longest time. I actually really love my double bed. Our double bed is now in the guest room because Jamie's like, oh, we should have another bed. And so we should get a new bed instead of getting a new bed for the guest room bed. And we went for a bigger bed. I think there's a queen, there's a king. I don't know. It's a slightly bigger bed. But the reality is we still take up the exact same amount of space, whether it's a double bed or a queen bed or a king bed. When we visit hotel rooms, we're still 
like very close to each other. And if the bed is bigger and we're wanting to like stick our legs out for like heat regulation, then you just go to the edge of the bed. Whatever the distance that edge might be. Why is it such a big deal between a king and a queen? Hotels are nice. <laughs> my parents bought us a queen for our guest room. My dad gave us a wink and said, never make your guest room too comfortable. I <laughs> have not thought of that. That sounds like sound advice. You gave him a decision. It was a no. Stand firm. This is your home and you decide what goes in it. I think that's a wonderful message to end on. I totally agree with this. Best of luck. OP. Whew. I feel like this wasn't such a controversial Just No Mills episode. Like it hasn't left me feeling like my blood is boiling. The mother-in-laws have behaved this damn round. Well, they've not fully behaved, but they've not been as naughty as they normally are. Thank you so much for watching Gorgeous Peaches. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. If you would like to share something, please pop your gorgeous little fuzzy butts downstairs in the comment section. Let's have a chat. Just remember to be kind. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to. Give this video a thumbs up and I'll see you next time with another video. Be kind and have a great day. Bye.